In this video lesson, we're going to learn how to write the terms of an arithmetic sequence, graph arithmetic sequences, write arithmetic sequences as functions. Writing the terms of an arithmetic sequence. A sequence is an ordered list of numbers. Each number in the sequence is called a term. Each term, a sub n, has a specific position, n, in the sequence. So if we look right here, the first term is 5, then 10, then 15, then 20, then 25, and then this is the nth term, a sub n. In an arithmetic sequence, the difference between each pair of consecutive terms is the same. This difference is called the common difference. Each term is found by adding the common difference to the previous term. So you can see here that we continue to add 5. 5 would be the common difference. Um, we're adding 5 each time to get to the next term. For this example, we're going to write the next three terms of the arithmetic sequence. So the first thing I'm going to do is find the common difference. And you can find the common difference by just taking any term and then subtracting the previous term. So in this case, I'm going to do negative 14 minus and then negative 7. This becomes a plus. And then I get negative 7. So my common difference is negative 7. And you could probably just tell in this example, but in other examples, it might be a little bit harder. Um, anyway, so now I just have to find the next three terms. So the first term is negative 7, then negative 14, then negative 21, then negative 28. And you can kind of tell if you just keep subtracting 7 from the previous term, we're going to get negative 35. And then the next term would be negative 42. And the next term would be negative 49. And now we're done with this one. In this example, we're going to graph the arithmetic sequence 4, 8, 12, and 16. And then it asks, what do you notice? So what I'm going to do here to graph this, if we look at our axes, we have n, the number of the term, the position of the term, and then a sub n, which is the value of that uh, term at that number. So I'm going to make a table. So I have n, the number or the position of the term, and then a sub n, that value. So I will just do, let's look at our axis. One, two, three, four. We'll start with four, because that's what we have. We have four terms here. And this is four, eight, 12, and 16. And now I'm just going to plot these like they're ordered pairs. So I'll zoom out a little bit. I have one comma four, two comma eight, three comma 12, and 4, 16. And what I notice here is that this is a linear relationship. I could draw a line through these points, okay? So what we can deduce here is that an arithmetic sequence uh, gives us a linear relationship on a graph. And now we're done with this one. For example three, we're gonna identify an arithmetic sequence from a graph. Does this graph represent an arithmetic sequence? Explain. Well, I'm going to look at this graph. And if we notice, we have a common difference here, OK? My first term is 15. My next term, my second term is 12. My third term is 9. And my fourth term is 6, OK? Notice the common difference here is going to be minus 3, OK? Because each time, I'm subtracting 3. So yes, this is an arithmetic sequence. And we know this because we do have a common difference between our points. Another way to tell this is by looking at the graph and noticing that we do have a linear relationship. If you drew a line through all these points, all these points would be on that line. It is possible to draw a line through all these points. So anyway, th that's two different ways that you can tell that this is an arithmetic sequence. And now we're done with this one. Writing arithmetic sequences as functions. Because consecutive terms of an arithmetic sequence have a common difference, the sequence has a constant rate of change. So, the points represented by any arithmetic sequence lie on a line. You can use the first term and a common difference to write a linear function that describes an arithmetic sequence. Let a sub 1 equal 4, and let d equal 3. So if you notice, we have our position, and then our a sub n term, and then we have it using... Um, a sub n and d, and then we have it using our numbers, a sub 1 equals 4 and, and d equals 3 here. So the first term would just be a sub 1, or 4 in this case. The next term would be a sub 1 plus d, and then 4 plus 3. The next term would be a sub 1 plus 2d, 
Okay, that would be the third term. Okay, we just start with our term, and then since it's twice removed from the first term, we just add double the common difference, and then and so on. We'll add triple the common difference, aka on the nth term, we're just going to do n minus one times the common difference, and then plus our initial value. Okay, so we're going to see a formula down here. Let a sub n be the nth term of an arithmetic sequence with the first term a sub one and a common difference d. The nth term is given by a sub n equals a sub 1 plus quantity n minus 1 all times d, okay, where d is the common difference and n is the position of the term and a sub n is whatever um, value of that position you want. So I just want to talk a little bit about this formula. You can totally use this formula, um, but I actually recommend doing something slightly different. And it involves figuring out what the theoretical zeroth term will be. When I say zeroth, I mean like a sub zero in this case. Now, this doesn't make sense in real life. You can't have a zeroth uh, term in your sequence. You'll always have the first term. But if you use logic and the pattern, it's actually a little bit easier because it's more like slope-intercept form. Okay. So another way to write this is a sub n equals a sub zero, what that theoretical term before the first term would be and then plus n times d, okay? So you can use either of these uh, formulas in order to find your function for the arithmetic sequence. For example four, we're gonna find the nth term of an arithmetic sequence. Write an equation for the nth term of the arithmetic sequence, 14, 11, 8, 5, dot, dot, dot. And then we wanna find the 50th term. Well, if I wanted to just find like the fifth or sixth term, it'd be easy to just look at the pattern. But to find the 50th term or a really high number, I don't want to have to just keep counting by the common difference, okay? So writing a formula is actually a quicker way to accomplish this. So if you remember, we had our formula, a sub n equals a sub one plus quantity n minus one times d. I'm gonna do it the other way as well. But for here, um, I need to figure out a few things. Okay, a sub n is equal to a sub 1, the first term, so that's 14. Okay, and then plus n minus 1, that stays the same, because remember, this is going to be in terms of n. It's going to be a sub n is our output, you can think of, and n is our input. Okay, and then times d, the common difference, well, if you see, to get from 14 to 11 to 8 to 5, I'm subtracting 3 each time. So my common difference is negative 3. Now I can just distribute this. And I get 14 minus 3n plus 3. And that is equal to a sub n. And then I just simplify. I get a sub n equals negative 3n plus 17. And that is our formula for the first part. Now, I'm going to show you the other way to do this um, using the, the zeroth term, which is really not a, a term. First, I'm going to erase this junk. Um, okay, so now, that other formula that I showed you, it's the exact same thing, but you need to uh, just use a little bit of logic with the common difference to get to that theoretical zeroth term. So it's going to be a sub n equals a sub zero. This is what I'm talking about, the theoretical term here. And then plus n d, okay? Well, a sub 1 is 14, and I know my common difference is negative 3, because I'm, I'm subtracting 3 as I go to the right. But as I go to the left, I'm actually adding 3 each time. So I add 3, add 3, add 3. Well, if I add 3 to 14, that would get me to my theoretical next term to the left, which would be 17. So a sub 0 in this case would be 17, okay? So I have a sub n equals 17 plus, and then n just stays the same. And then my common difference is negative 3, as we've already discussed. And I can just rearrange this equation and get the same thing. a sub n equals negative 3n plus 17. If you notice, this right side of our uh, screen right now took one less step than this side. I do think this is a little bit easier, but it does involve using this a sub 0 fake term. Um, so just use whatever method that you want. Okay. Anyway, now that we've finally simplified this and got it in multiple ways, let's figure out the 50th term. Well, to find the 50th term, that's just when n equals 50. So I'm going to plug 50 in for n. So I'm going to write a sub 50 equals negative 3 times 50 plus 17. 
and this is going to give me negative 150 plus 17, and that simplifies to negative 133. So the 50th term of this sequence is negative 133. And now we're done with this one. You can rewrite the equation for an arithmetic sequence with the first term a sub 1 and a common difference d in function notation by replacing a sub n with f of n. f of n equals a sub 1 plus quantity n minus 1 all times d. Or, once again, we could use our other one, which is f of n equals a sub 0 plus n d. Either one. The domain of the function is the set of positive integers. Because if you think about it, you can't have a zeroth term, like we said. So this is why this is the theoretical term. Um, you can only have one first term or second term or third term and so on, positive integers. Example five, writing real life functions. Online bidding for a purse increases by $5 for each bid after the $60 initial bid. So we can look at this table of values. It has um, some of the bids, bid numbers one through four. Anyway, part A, write a function that represents the arithmetic sequence. Okay. Well, we're going to use the same um, formula from before. f of n equals a sub 1 plus quantity n minus 1 times d, or f of n equals a sub 0 plus n d, my favorite. Okay. So first, I'm going to find what that theoretical uh, a sub n would be. I'll use this one. Okay. a sub 1 is 60, so that if you're going to use this one, you would plug in 60. But in this case, I see that I'm adding 5 each time, so that means that my common difference is 5. So if I went to the left, I'm actually subtracting 5 each time, so my zeroth term would really be 55. So for part A, f of, and I'll write the general form right now, a sub 0 plus nd. Okay, well, f of n equals 55 plus n. And then my common difference, like I just said, is 5. I'm adding 5 each time. So that's f n times 5. So I can rewrite this as f of n equals 5n plus 55. If you solve it using the other formula, you get the exact same thing. Now I want to graph the function. Okay. Well, we want to use only integers for our inputs, Okay, because we do, we don't, we're not going to have any decimals. You can't have like a 1 and a half term. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so I will go over and only graph the integers of this function. You can literally just plot the ordered pairs on the table. So that is going to be 160, 2, 65, 3, 70, 4, 75, 5, 80, and 6, 85. Okay, so now I've graphed this. And then we have the winning bid is... $105. How many bids were there? Okay. Well, that just means we want to figure out what number in the sequence it is. Okay. So we know the winning amount is $105. So that is actually our function value, f of n. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to plug this 105 in for my f of n and then solve for n. So I'm going to write this 105 equals 5n plus 55. So scroll up a bit. Then I will subtract 55 on both sides. I get 50 equals 5n, divide 5, and we get n equals 10. So the 10th bid was the winner. And now we're done.